So you say you bought a used bike off of Craigslist of all places and you think you got a good deal but do you really get a good deal? Let's check this out and see what this is going to cost you to get it up and running after this. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Welcome to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging out with the guy. Hi, I'm Justin the guy. Obviously, I have a garage shop. Taking scary how to use bikes one bike at a time. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe. Hey, welcome back to I Know A Guy Bicycles. Hanging out with the guy on this old bike series. Guess what? We got ourselves a classic Le Mans Alpe d'Huez. Yeah, say that three times, four times, ten times fast. Alpe d'Huez is up there with Boignieres. Eh? I can't even say that right. It just comes out wrong. Anyway, it's a Le Mans aluminum with a carbon seat stay and chain stay. Hmm, unique. That is a little different. Saw a few of those on Gary Fisher's and a few other brands out there in this vintage. Um, and I wouldn't say it's not that old, but you know, time flies, right? When you're having fun. But these things are awesome. I've had a few of these and I've actually fixed up and they're an awesome little bike. Um, can't complain. They were actually under the truck umbrella when truck was leasing the, the Le Mans rights and having the specs and all that of geometry and putting good bond tracker stuff on it. But you know, after age and certain issues over time, um, you know, these things have sometimes taken a little bit of beating and they do need some, breathe some life back into them. So that's what we're going to do here. But I'm actually taking the perspective of you just bought this and then you're going to be taken to a guy like me at a bike shop near you to have an estimate done and see how much it's going to cost you. <sighs> Yeah, scary, isn't it? Well, let's check this out. So, got three things to a bike, right? This is the three main perspective. You got the frame and fork. That's the biggest expensive lift. If something's wrong with the frame and fork, you're pretty much done with a box of parts. So you wanna make sure you inspect that when you look at the bike. Uh, number two is the wheel set. Wheel set is very important because that's where you're actually contacting the road. And also, it's a, one of the nicer upgrade areas where you can upgrade that bike to less roll resistance and smoother and faster but that is a very solid third if it's something wrong with those wheels that's the second expensive kind of hit you're going to take and third and lastly is the componentry like the shifting and brakes and the derailleurs why is that important well there's a lot of pieces to them which if there's only one or two things wrong with them is not very expensive to fix or refurbish but if a lot of it is broken, then that can add up too. But you can't really just, you, you know, you can, but you don't really need to ditch the bike entirely and start from scratch. So with the frame and fork, make sure you have a good bedrock to work off of, which is the frame and fork. And that's what we're gonna get to at the end here. But first we gotta break the parts down and kind of estimate what we're gonna look at, what we're gonna cost. Pretty much every bike that you get as second hand, Grip tape, tape, handlebar grip, something like that, your contact point usually needs to be replaced. Anywhere between 20, 20 to 30 bucks, 40, depending how quality you want to get. Second one is a saddle. Saddles is one, they usually get dinged up and scarred or whatever, but second, you want to make sure it fits you correctly. That's the second contact point. So you want those two contact points to be as comfortable as possible. And lastly, and not least, is the last one is the pedals for your third contact. But when you're looking at that perspective, yeah, if you're in the clipless, those might work. If not, get some platform pedals, 10, 15 bucks left. So keep in mind, those are the three things that you're probably going to have to switch out immediately. So right there off the top of my head, anywhere from 50 bucks right there. Then you get into the nitty and gritty. Let's dive into this. So let's inspect the wheels. Um, that's where I usually start taking things apart. Oh, oh boy, that's a stiff skewer. So you quick release cut or take the quick release off. Sometimes using a tire lever is nice to get that leverage ah, that you may need to get it started because whoever put this on there muscled it. Oh, or it got there. Tight over a period of time or rust, what have you. 
So the rear wheel. Rear wheel is going to take most of the hit of most of when you ride. Because when you're riding, you might miss it with your front wheel and you're gonna bash it with your rear. So on this particular one, um, uh, this, you know, this uh, Bond Chugger wheels, and I was a service manager at the time when these were new. Whoo, dated myself. Anyway, um, we knew we had a problem with some of these because on the drive side, they over tensioned them at the manufacturer where they took a lot of material where they started cracking. Bam, we got a crack right here. So, number one, rear wheel is toast. So, not safe to ride. I can save the hub for something else, maybe a skewer or two, but wheels a goner. Even though it has its reflector on there, which means it probably hasn't been ridden too much, just was there anyway. Um, and also the cassette, this is probably salvageable to be put on another one, but we must need to check with a chain checker to see if that chain is stretched. So, ideas. Every two chains will stretch to one cassette as a rule of thumb. And this guy is stretched to a 0.75, which means the chain is stretched. That needs to be replaced. I'm going to bet that cassette might need to be replaced, but we're not going to add that to the total list one. That's like a $25 to $30 lift. We're definitely going to have to do a chain. You might be able to get away with that cassette. So right now, Rear wheel, let's just say this wheel is gonna cost you 100 bucks. New, you know, new rear 100, you know, 100, 100 bucks, it's not top of the line, it's more mid-range, replacement one, 100 bucks. And a chain, that's gonna be another 15 to 20 bucks. So what are we into right now? You guessed it, we're right out about 115 to 120, somewhere around there. Looking at these tires, these are the original tires. Yeah, they're gonna be replaced. So you got that on top of the tires. Tires are gonna run you, good set. I'm gonna just go a little higher on this, about 80 bucks, so we're right in at $200. Okay, so let's keep on going. So we're $200 into it. And I'm gonna dive into here, look at the front wheel. Front hub's a little bit loose, and that wheel I was talking about was just that one wheel. It's not a pair. You're looking at a pair. You might be able to find a used set, but you got to know what you're doing. So most likely you're going to be going to a bike shop. Oh, look at that. That, that lock ring is loose. Oh, and yeah, kind of grindy. So if even if the wheel's fine, let's just say the wheel's fine, the, rear, the front hub's going to have to be overhauled. 25 bucks. So we're at 225. All right. Feel like action here when we're doing this. So anyway, um, diving further into this, cables and housing. Cables and housing is not that expensive, right? I mean, you know, I'm talking about like eight, to, let's just say 10 bucks for materials, so we're at 235 uh, as a parts on those. Uh, ooh, what's going on there? Kinda, kinda, oh boy. I hope I got that on film. This is <laughs> rusty. It's been sitting outside. Um, when you're seeing cables that have rusted, um, mm, we'll have a fuss with that later. Yeah, so cables, <laughs> yeah, all the cables in the house are gonna be replaced, which I was gonna do that anyway. That's part of the estimate on that. But yeah, uh, that's not a very good indicator when you're seeing that white poof of orange coming out of the cables and housing. That is just nuts. So let's just proceed here. All right. So checking the shifters, you know, you should do this while you're test riding the bike. This was not test rideable at all. So um, I, my advice to the individual would just been a walk away from it. But uh, since I refurbished road bikes, this is what I'm kind of looking for is gems to kind of, I can put my love into and bring back to life. Plus I have a little soft spot for these little mons. I mean, they're kind of cool. So you got that going for you. Um, all right, so we got that taken off that. Oh, let's kill that computer mount. Um, most of the zip ties, so we're just gonna cut that off. Let's see, we got a little bit of breathing room here to work with. So the Mons, this one's probably a 2003 or four, somewhere around there. 
We'll double check that and see if my guess is right. Um, and these were pretty decent road bikes, and this one had Altegra on it. So Altegra is the second step down from the top of the line uh, from Durace and Shimano. So it was actually pretty decent. I'd have to look at the MSRP, but hey, you know, get yourself a bike that's under a grand that was back in the day, close to the top of the line for a starter road bike. Hey, that's a good way to start. Not too worried about this being sit out too much because um, uh, it's aluminum. It's not gonna rust and carbon doesn't you know, compromise the weather either. So it's gonna be okay. It's just the bearings or anything with steel, which is your bearings, your chain rings, cassettes, that kind of thing. And I mean, there's a little bit of rust on the chain and I'm gonna keep the chain to measure it up to uh, the new chain. But I'll double check it to make sure it's measured out correctly. So I'm not just, you know, uh, throwing bat on bat and going to adjustment and all of a sudden, whoa, the chain's too short and rips my rear derail off. So we don't want that. Um, there's plenty of videos out there. Uh, Park Tools is one that has beautiful video series on doing me bicycle mechanics. So if you ever needed to fix a flat, replace a chain, replace cables and housing, any of that kinds of stuff, um, yeah, they're a good one, a good sort of resource to go to. So I've also noticed on these particular models, of Altegra, the, um, don't do this on your uh, bedroom or your floor inside. I mean, get this black stuff in there. <laughs> uh, your significant other will kill you. Um, anyway, or, or your parents if you still live with them. Um, yeah, so the jockey pulley you want to look for. Sometimes there's usually sometimes there's a crack in here, and also you want them to be kind of like your your teeth on your chain rings, which has a scoop and a flat spot and goes back down. So you know, when they're worn out, it becomes more of a shark tooth. So looking at these jockey pulleys, and they look like they are OEM. Um, they haven't been used too much. So the story so far, looking at the history of the bike by looking at the parts. I'm saying the bike got purchased and didn't get ridden. It's just one of those things. And the chain stretch uh, can happen within the first year. So maybe it got ridden for a year, maybe a year and a half, and it got shelved. I mean, it's just one of those things. Um, a lot of bikes end up that way. And you know, back in the 80s and the 90s, there was a big running joke. We used to sell exercise equipment at Parker Bikes back in the day. And I can guarantee you about 95% of that stuff never got used that we sold. And uh, that, that rest of 95% became, guess what? A clothes hanger for washer and dryer to hang your clothes. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> uh, one of those things. And bicycles happen to run that way too sometimes. People do a purchase that are just not getting into it. So the wonderful world of 2023, as that's when those videos being shot, we're out after the COVID and you know, a lot of people have actually been inspired to do a lot more exercises and riding and so forth, which is awesome, um, which has brought a lot of people into any kind of outdoor industry, which is great for the health, great for mental, and you know, I love cycling and, this, and all things and comfort set to, to a certain point, and um, it's kind of cool to see this insurgent of people still getting into cycling and enjoying it. Well, now we have the nitty gritty of, oh, the economy's getting really unstable and inflation and all that stuff. So people will be a little more um, tight with their budget and including moi. So gotta make sure the bikes that I'm refurbishing are one, and number one, good value. Uh, number two, price appropriately. So when I'm purchasing them, I'm not getting too out of hand on uh, taking too much of a risk. And luckily for you customers out there, I base it off of, I mean, I'm not high volume by any means, but it is a lot of averages. So when you look at averages, like, okay, I'll take a little bit of hit on this one, but um, it's a pretty cool bike. I bring it to the market and just want to make a little bit more profit on to offset the ones I may have lost a little bit of that margin range. So it is at the end of the day, still a business. And guess what? I know business, especially the, you know, the cycling industry. So when you're looking at all those kinds of ins and outs, yeah, I'm very fortunate to be able to follow my passion, but I'm still, I still have to make a buck, like the rest of you out there. Uh, but, I mean, I'm not in it, obviously, to make millions, so because 
this is not something you make a lot of money at. Um, but I really enjoy doing it. And for the communications I've had or interactions with the customers I have got into cycling, they've been very good. Hear that little squeak? That means this is very dry. So needs a lot of cleaning and relubing to bring back to life. Um, so far, the trailers look good. The brake pads are okay. Um, they may harden over time, so they may need to be replaced. We'll see that after sanding them down a little bit and getting that more fresh glaze. Um, we'll take these pedals off. And pedals, the trick to pedals, pedal forward to release them. Oh, that's if it doesn't come off. Okay, may have to address those a little later due to the fact that knowing this bike has been in the rust for a while, or rain, or outside, um, might have to soak those. A little bit of PV blaster, which I thought that would be tighter, but it wasn't. That's great. Um, to soak them up to kind of release them. When you use PV blaster, which is this stuff here, oh, it stinks. So make sure you do it outside. Um, people will hate you if you do it inside. So don't do that inside. Take that outside, let it soak outside for a while. Help that uh, release these guys. And you can take off pedals when they're off the bike, or the crank's off the bike too. Just have to use, make sure you have leverage. And leverage is a huge thing that all bike mechanics know really well when you're taking things apart. So this wasn't got awfully stuck on there, so that's a good sign. And looking at the crank on this guy, you can see some of those kind of scarring. I'm gonna polish these up with a little bit of metal polish. It'll become aluminum shine. That's just your oxidation, a little bit of oxidation look of aluminum. Yeah, aluminum doesn't rust, but it has the oxidation to it. So you wanna polish that up, maybe put a little clear coat and kind of see a little bit of rush on the steel shaft that's inside and then a little bit of gunk inside there. Looking at these teeth, um, looking on these teeth, Looks like he's never used the small chain ring. The minimum had a little bit, and all he was, the individual that rode this, was in the big ring. And you can see the teeth are still have those flat spots to them. You'll see a little bit of rampage and so forth. That is very normal. And you'll see some variation of height of certain teeth on chain rings. Those are designed to aid the chain to go up and down. So don't freak out. They're like, oh, my teeth are growing down. You know, it's like they're usually, they used to do really prominently in the early or in the 90s, and people would freak out about a new bike and whatever, but that's that's what they're designed to do. So don't don't tweak, it's okay, we'll get that figured out. The other question is, is um, <laughs> you're gonna clean that up a little bit, you can really see the chunkage. So basically, this looks like it's been bashed around the garage. Bashed around the garage a little bit too long. So, anywho. So I'm gonna check these bearing and bearings with my you know, fingers, see if they're smooth. Uh, no notching, so that seems to be good. So that's going to be a little bit of a savior. I do have replacement cartridge bearings if need be. Um, I do take this cable guide off. Um, when you take the cable guide off, you'll see it'll expose um, a lot of numbers. Those are mostly your serial numbers. And on this guy, we actually have the stamp. Um, from the manufacturer. So let me give you a little closer look at this. This is pretty cool. So what we got here is we got the serial number, but also this has the manufacturing number and size, which really helps me out of figuring out what size these are. Because Le Mans, they have geometries that are really kind of weird. Um, in a sense, they're not weird and bad. And weird is just it measured out differently from like center to center versus center to the top tube, which all that means is sometimes it's highly kind of hard to identify. This one's a 57, so that gives me a great calls <laughs> comfort level of knowing what size it is and works. And there's a the serial number, and then you'll see the stamping here, which kind of reflects the model number and actual serial number. But we'll clean this up and make sure it's uh, all good to go. But yeah, this is where you look at the bottom and kind of inspect that area, make sure there's no deans, and there's some little bit of grimage. And also, when you're looking at the top tube here, that's where those car racks can get to it. And then you see this little bit of corrosion here. That's where I was having a hard time getting this housing out. That kind of, I'm gonna have to tap that out and really lube it and polish it up. But that should come back all, all to life very well. So I think we're doing good, but we're gonna take a little polish to this and do a little bit further inspection. All right, getting down to the nitty gritty. So 
Mm, get on. Nasty rag here. Okay, so the frame is dirty. It's been sitting outside um, at some point, and it's been in the garage and other, not written. So it's gonna need a lot of loving. Um, for me, for doing frame detailing, this is something that's gonna like, woo, bring it to life. I tell you, um, it's gonna be beautiful. I mean, this aluminum looks dull, but after after I polish it all up, it's gonna be beautiful. So. I'm inspecting the carbon, make sure it's not flared out anywhere, there's no snags or damage to it, the aluminum looking for any kind of cracks around the welds, um, that kind of thing. And looking at this bike and the componentry, it does not look like it's been used all too much, so that's a good, very good sign. Um, start getting all the little darker sides of this. And, uh, and the person I did buy this from, they, they did admit that they didn't ride it very often. And uh, it looks like the fork blades are great. Head tube stickers look pretty good intact. Um, he admitted that he didn't ride it very much. And actually it was in a really part of Colorado where even with a triple, <laughs> it's either straight up or straight down. So that kind of riding didn't really appeal to him when he moved here to Colorado. So he didn't really do that. So yes. Chain stays feel really good. Um, let's really get that dirt out of the bottom bracket area so you can get a good look. Make sure there's nothing compromised. And I mentioned this before, you look at welding on aluminum um, and you'll see uh, welds like this one is really kind of uh, flat. It's like a, like a plasma kind of welding technique versus the high bead. And what's cool about that, this is where Gary Klein taught Trek how to weld frames. And yeah, Klein, Trek, Lamont, Gary Fishers were all being built in the same facility in Wild Wisconsin. They had different geometries, uh, don't get me wrong, they rode differently and they were, had a little bit different specs, um, but they were built by a lot of the same people. So, um, and when we're talking, going back to the welds, the welders, they had three classifications of welders at the time. They have A, B, and a C. And the C was not the greatest welder, so they do the welds in the areas where you don't really see very much, like the cranks that would cover that. Uh, the B welders would do like the, the TIG and um, the areas where the dropouts would be. Then the, and the A welders would do like the head tube area and the C tube area where they put those together. And that's where you see really nice, intricate, even beadwork. And you can still see the beadwork on these. It's just very light, but a little more flat. They're not ground down. Um, there's other companies out there that used to take their wells and grind them down, then paint the, they paint the frames. And grinding, there's a risk factor to it. Let's just say that without getting into details. But, but with these particular wells, they're a higher grade well. Um, they also use, um, this is 6066 60, aluminum, which is a little higher grade. Um, and it's heat treated. Well, all aluminums are heat treated. And you'll kind of see the tubing is changed on the front here and kind of drawn to a different angle. Same thing here. So this one starts off as an oval up front uh, to the down tube, going vertical, then the oval changes to horizontal. So this gives you stiffness and strength vertically up front. And also this gives you stiffness and strength laterally. So when you're cranking, more of the energy is going to your drivetrain. So all that type of aluminum uh, work, especially aluminum, within the Trek series of bikes, were definitely influenced by Gary Fisher. Guarantee it. Gary Fisher came on the scene of the Trek world. Trek was bonding, gluing their frames together, aluminum alike. And when Gary Fisher came in, or not Gary Fisher, uh, Gary Klein, I say Gary Fisher? Gary Klein came in and then that all changed. So Klein bikes changed Trek's landscape from 90s on. So anyway, okay, just have some scuffs, maybe a little ding or two. Mostly this is gonna clean up. So what's the cost of this person that just bought this bike? You know, okay, all those cables and housing and all that. I'm into it, let's say with tax, 275, right? That sounds about right. 275. Just for the parts. 
Okay, you can do that yourself. You can YouTube a whole bunch of videos and put all those things on there and take your time and put it, you know, it'll take you a month to figure it all out and get all that together. To do all the work on this, encompasses the tune-up and labor, you are definitely looking at anywhere from, depending on the bike shops in your area and their shop rates, um, on, the, on the lesser side, around 150. More appropriate, it's gonna be two, 250. So you're looking at, with parts and labor, bing, this comes to at least $500 to fix up. That's double than what this bike went for. Thanks for spending time with me. Hope you got some insights out of this. Thank you for hanging out in the garage. Until next time, look at these gorgeous videos of this bike. I'm just